So um, without uh, further ado, I guess we'll transition back to science. And uh, Dr. Timothy Henrich from uh, the Brigham and Harvard uh, is going to tell us about uh, the patients referred to as the Boston patients. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, Timothy, that was a fantastic story. So I actually want to show the first slide is your New England Journal article. Uh, that I read when I was a clinical fellow um, doing infectious disease training at, at the Brigham and Mass General. Um, and this was a time of financial despair for a lot of young people going into infectious disease when the NIH was uh, going to its lowest funding levels ever. We were all thinking about writing grants and thinking about how to do this. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, I almost gave up. I said, well, maybe I could be a clinician. This would be fantastic. I could do all this type of work. I really like, I really wanted to do research on translational virology. And it was really this paper when it came out in 2007 that changed my mind and said, no, 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 this is why I need to stick with it. This is, this is awesome. This is the proof of concept that you can do this. You can take somebody with established HIV infection, living with HIV, and eradicate that. I mean, that's, that was huge. Um, and so that was really my inspiration to kind of continue on uh, to my own training. So thank you for uh, keeping me on track. Uh, scientifically and academically, uh, but I think you were an inspiration to pretty much everybody I know that was training and thinking about this at the time. It was just, it was huge to our field and huge to especially the young researchers and clinicians. It really, I think, uh, energized us at the time. So that's my, my preamble. <clears throat> so uh, the questions I want to know is why did this work? Why, why is Timothy Ray Brown now HIV free? How is, how is he cured? Well, certainly these cells that he received, these CCR5 Delta 32 cells are very important. Uh, and as what you can see here uh, is that uh, HIV, this is, this is by the way a little bit oversimplification. This is not exactly what happens. But essentially HIV binds to CD4, but also needs another co-receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4. I, there's a few others actually potentially can use uh, to really enter and get into a cell to really cause an infection. And of course, if you block, oops, ah, uh, there we go. If you do block one of these co-receptors, then uh, obviously uh, Timothy's uh, virus is only able to use CCR5, was very fortunate, uh, that you essentially block the ability for that, that virus to enter the cell. Uh, and just one more slide uh, before I stop uh, <laughs> talking about our previous speaker. Uh, but we can see here is that uh, I want to show you that, that you're going to see a lot of pluses and minuses in this talk, which is essentially how we think about transplantation. Everything minus means before you get your stem cells transfused. Everything plus is after your uh, transplantation. So minus is before, plus is after. And as you can see, uh, despite stopping antiretroviral therapy right around the same time of the stem cell transplantation, uh, seven years later now, there's still no detectable or at least definitive detectable uh, replication competent HIV virus, uh, and this is cure. So this brings up the questions. What led to the cure? Was it the engraftment of these cells that are inherently resistant to his virus? Is that, was, was that the sole reason that this worked? Was that the only reason that this actually made a difference? Well, we can start to parse that out. This is a recent New England Journal of Medicine article from uh, uh, Sangamo and UPenn. Fascinating article, Pablo Tebas and Carl June, um, who have been doing some really, really exciting work. Uh, and this is essentially taking people's CD4 C, uh, T cells who are infected, modifying them to eliminate CCR5 expression, to cut up the genes so it can't express CCR5 appropriately, and then refuse them back into the patient. So what if you could modify those cells? What would happen? And let me show you a few slides just to show um, is that, again, day zero now is from cell infusion. So we're going to use this minus and plus. This is not stem cell transplantation, but it is cell infusion, so we'll go with that. Uh, at day zero, they reinfuse these modified CD4 cells. And you can see that overall, when you look at the modified cells on the top, uh, there is this large increase in the number of cells uh, the CD4 counts. Uh, that did decrease over time, but re actually plateaued uh, even up to almost a year after they were initially infused. If you look down below, however, uh, the cells you see up here are down in red. A majority of the cells are actually still not modified. So these are still CCR5 wild-type cells uh, that these patients have, at least except for one patient, I believe. Um, so there's part of the cells, but not a majority of the cells uh, were actually CCR5 uh, deleted. 
This is the data. It's a little confusing, a little busy slide, but I think it's a really nice slide. If you look at day zero again, this is when cells were infused. In the gray area is treatment interruption. So this study uh, took a cohort of patients and they stopped them about a month after they got their cells that were CCR5 deleted, and they wanted to see would virus come back, and if so, how did it come back? As you can see, virus did come back in all the patients. Uh, again, remember, only a minority of the cells are CCR5 edited. Uh, but what we see is that when you compare, uh, when you have acute infection like this, a rebound, uh, you often see kind of a peak of viremia, at least during acute infection, and then this kind of set point. So it kind of comes down, immune, immune system kicks back in, uh, and you get a, a new viral set point after this. And Unfortunately, I think that because of the 16 weeks, some of these patients were still going down. So their viral loads were actually decreasing still while they restarted ART, so it was a little bit difficult. But certainly a subset of patients, when you look at their viral set points from before this experiment, so their, their highest viral load in, the, in history, there's actually significant decreases before they restarted their enterotroviral therapy. Actually, this patient in green uh, that you see on the bottom actually uh, became undetectable before the treatment uh, was restarted, although it did blip, so it wasn't curative, but they're, they're still HIV. Uh, this patient was actually Delta, 30, uh, Delta 32 heterozygous, meaning they had one copy of the Delta 32. So maybe they were at an advantage because they already were having difficulty expressing CCR5 in some of their own cells. Certain other patients uh, did not necessarily have very big changes from their set points, but again, uh, treatment was restarted before uh, they were allowed to reach this state. So, possible. So certainly uh, CCR5 certainly played a major role. Uh, I think there's some very exciting therapeutics and strategies to think about how to modulate CCR5 or how to reduce the expression of CCR5 and how that could be potentially useful. Of course, not all patients have CCR5 only using virus, especially as uh, people have with progressive disease. So then the question comes up, what about total body irradiation? What about high-dose conditioning chemotherapy you get before transplantation? And essentially, what about just obliterating all the infected cells up front and then repopulating them with cells that are resistant to HIV infection or not resistant to HIV infection? So does, does this high-dose chemotherapy irradiating the body, giving antithomicide, antilymphocyte immune therapy, does this really make the difference? Was this help? Did this help? Well, we can actually go back in time. I apologize about this small text. It's the only slide with small <laughs> text here. But uh, back from the late 80s and the early 90s, there were several patients that underwent stem cell transplantation. This is before combination enterotroviral therapy. So this was AZT monotherapy uh, or no therapy. And what you can see in three individuals, actually by day 41 to day 30, day 40, 128 days after their transplantation, their HIV viral loads were not detectable um, by standard assays. Now, these were not as sensitive the assays that we have now, so it's certainly possible they had some, but at least by 400 copies, there was nothing detectable of peripheral blood. Uh, several of these patients also underwent uh, autopsy, and um, unfortunately, all three patients uh, died, so we don't have long-term follow-up information or if this would actually have been durable uh, or long-term. Uh, but even in tissues that were taken out, there was not uh, HIV detected. So it was, a, it was a preamble that maybe this could work without CCR5 Delta 32 cells, uh, but again, because the patients passed away, we don't have a lot of information. Okay. Well, there's been other patients, uh, not just our patients, but a few patients that have received uh, stem cell transplantation, myoblative stem cell transplantation and non-myoblative, uh, with combination enterotroviral therapy. And they've had PBMC DNA, so essentially their viral uh, cellular reservoirs from peripheral blood disappear shortly after transplantation. Unfortunately, several of these patients have, have also passed away shortly after transplant, so we don't have a lot of long-term follow-up or treatment interruption information. Uh, the European group is also uh, looking at uh, patients, uh, Dr. Hutter is part of this as well, and have, have other patients that they're looking at now, uh, some with mixtures of CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous cord blood cells with adult donor cells that are not, so kind of mixtures, and they found that in that particular situation, there was a more rapid decline in DNA uh, of HIV in cells after stem cell transplantation, but unfortunately, this patient also passed away, so we don't have a lot of information. <clears throat> This is one of the patients uh, from 2007. This, is, uh, this was a report that came out just about the same time that the England Journal of Medicine came out uh, on Timothy Ray Brown. And uh, it was very interesting. This person did have a myeloblative uh, stem cell transplantation in France. Uh, it was not with Delta 32 homozygous um, uh, cells that we're aware of. 
uh, probably not from what we see here, but they also had a rapid decline in their DNA, as you can see in the middle line, after their stem cell transplantation, which again is day zero. Um, but this patient actually stopped ART uh, about 120 days after stem cell transplantation because of what they thought was perhaps toxicity due to the medications, all that turned out to be graft versus host disease, and the virus rebounded extremely rapidly, uh, up to uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies within days, uh, went back on ART and that quickly resuppressed. Uh, however, unfortunately, this patient also passed away from graft versus host disease and complications from the transplant itself. So let me talk, switch gears and just talk about our patients that we've been following. Uh, we've previously reported uh, HIV DNA reservoir reductions or loss of detectable reservoirs uh, in three individuals following reduced intensity conditioning stem cell transplant with CCR5 wild type, so normal susceptible donor cells. Now this is interesting. Our patients did not receive total body irradiation or antithymocyte immune globulin. They basically had non-myeloblative transplants. They have mixing of donor cells and their own recipient hematopoietic cells for up to nine months or even longer after their stem cell transplantation. So it's a little bit kinder and gentler. They get a lower dose of chemotherapy. They do not get irradiation. Uh, and they actually have a lower infection risk uh, post-transplantation. But this is not for all tumors or all cancers. Uh, certainly, like an aggressive leukemia, this may not be the way to go. Uh, however, um, it was considered uh, the way to go in the patient that we've been following. Uh, we do have long-term data on two patients. I should mention that this, this uh, study is currently ongoing. Uh, I think we just enrolled our sixth patient at our center as well, so we will have some more information for you, but of course it's going to take a while because these studies take years before we uh, fully understand what's going on, so we'll see. Uh, we'll keep you updated as we do. Uh, and uh, again, both underwent autologous stem cell transplant before their allogeneic stem cell transplant. So these patients got chemotherapy, salvage chemotherapy, salvage salvage chemotherapy, autologous stem cell transplant, which is where they get their own cells harvested and put back after high dose chemotherapy. And then they went to allogeneic stem cell transplant where they have cells from a different person. So they went a, a lot of uh, intensive therapy. They had readily detectable reservoirs before their allogeneic st uh, stem cell transplant despite all of this chemotherapy. But within eight to nine months, they lost it. we lost detection of HIV. So here's patient A. This is a, a, a man with perinatal acquired HIV. Uh, was a C mismatched unrelated donor, so an adult donor. Was one HLA mismatch, but that's okay. Uh, no TBI, no body irradiation, reduced intensity conditioning, and around 250 days or so after stem cell transplant, we lost detection of HIV in the cells, and we looked at different types of uh, DNA, RNA, et cetera, we just can't find anything. And this actually correlated with when they were 100%, what we call 100% chimerism, which means that 100% of their donors, of their cells are of donor origin. So the donor cells take over, and we lose detection of the DNA in their cells. Uh, we did apheresis about 4.3 years after to collect uh, billions of cells. We used some of them to test for DNA, which was negative. We tried stimulating the cells to try to get uh, virus out of them. Uh, these co-culture or outgrowth assays, we used hundreds of millions of purified CD4 cells and we still were not able to identify HIV. And just from this data alone, um, we, we uh, estimate that there's at least a three log reduction in PBMC DNA after stem cell transplant. And that's, that's huge. Uh, in patient uh, B, this is a man with sexually acquired HIV in the 80s, actually was off therapy until 2003, probably because he was Delta 32 heterozygous, like patient A and like Timothy Ray Brown, uh, before stem cell transplantation. But uh, again, we lose detection of HIV-1 DNA, RNA, et cetera, after full donor engraftment or 100% donor chimerism, which in this case was just under a year after transplantation. Again, no HIV from uh, cells from leukophoresis. Uh, again, viral outgrowth assays using hundreds of millions of cells was, uh, were negative. Uh, and we also uh, were able to get rectal tissue uh, from this patient at the time, uh, and no HIV DNA was uh, observed from that tissue as well. Again, minimum three log reduction. Well, we have a patient C. Now, this patient also underwent reduced intensity conditioning with a CCR5 wild type donor uh, and recipient. So, wild type susceptible cells replaced by wild type susceptible cells. And he unfortunately died from recurrent Hodgkin lymphoma six months post stem cell transplantation. But nonetheless, we saw a fairly rapid decline in the HIV DNA that correlated with uh, increasing donor chimerism. Now, the CD4 counts also did drop at that time, but even when we adjust or look at the CD4 cells, we see a decrease in the DNA and other markers for viral infection. So for our two patients at this point, we felt, well, we're having trouble finding 
HIV, uh, either in the peripheral blood or at least in one patient, the gut as well. So uh, we went through about six to eight months of discussion with the patients, with the patient's uh, clinical providers, their oncologists, <clears throat> as well as the ethics board, the institutional review board, and we felt that it would be safe and ethical to do a treatment interruption. Uh, analytical, which in other words, we would do very frequent clinical viral load monitoring every week or so. We'd look at DNA every two weeks. Uh, we'd follow them very closely clinically, and we would restart at any indication that the virus is coming back, either greater than 1,000 once or greater than 200 on a confirmed more than twice, or tw two or more times greater than 200. So we didn't want to let them sit and reach set point. As soon as we saw a virus, we thought it was, given the fact that they have cancer, they're on transplant, restart therapy. So this is patient A. Uh, for three months, uh, patient A had no detectable HIV RNA from clinical uh, load monitoring, uh, about 20 copies, maybe about 5 to 10 copy uh, assay detection limit. Uh, HIV DNA from cells was also negative on a biweekly basis uh, from this patient in the peripheral blood, was feeling fine, and unfortunately, uh, three months after transplantation, uh, we noticed a viral load of 900 copies. Uh, we immediately brought the patient back to our clinic and said we need to start antiretroviral therapy. We have to confirm this, et cetera. Uh, unfortunately, there were some adherence issues uh, involved with this and uh, only had a few doses of nefavirin based regimen uh, at that time. The viral load continued to increase uh, up to several million copies. He developed acute retroviral syndrome with fevers, headache, nausea, and aseptic meningitis. This was my nightmare as well as his nightmare. Uh, and unfortunately, also the development of a new K103N mutation because he had taken several doses of a long-acting drug, efavirenz, in the setting of a rapidly increasing viral load and re viral replication. This was not there at the 900 copies directly after uh, stopping. He is unfortunately, he is fortunately doing very well. So he, we finally got him back on therapy. Uh, he's fully suppressed. He's less than 20 copies. He's, he's feeling fine. So. But I want to show you also that uh, CSF sampling at the time of rebound, as there was a up, rapid upswing in his peripheral viral load, was, was actually less than 20 copies. It was detectable, but very low. He also had a decrease in the CD4 uh, T cell counts uh, very, that looked very much like acute retroviral syndrome. So very high viral loads followed by an acute decrease in CD4 T cell counts. Well, here's patient B. Uh, actually, we took off patient B first, uh, just for logistical reasons, because we wanted to stagger them, just in case things were happening. Uh, and this is the first eight months of patient B. Uh, he likes to tell me that uh, he was positive, negative, positive, and this is the negative part of his life, uh, or negative, positive, negative, positive, I guess is what, technically. Um, but we can see here that despite frequent viral load monitoring, DNA monitoring, we've done single copy assay, we harvested a lot of cells uh, peripherally, uh, we were not able to find very much as we continued along. He felt great for eight months, uh, essentially no detectable DNA, RNA, we just couldn't find anything. Uh, unfortunately, seven days after his last a viral load assay that was not detected. He developed fever, malaise, uh, felt terrible, thought he had Lyme disease because he was hiking the week before uh, in the mountains where there's a lot of Lyme disease where, uh, where we're from. Um, and unfortunately, that, that was acute retroviral syndrome as well. He immediately restarted a dolutegravir based therapy and had a fairly rapid uh, reduction in his viral load, and he's also now less than 20 copies and doing clinically extremely well. Uh, he did have a low-level viral load in his um, uh, cerebral spinal fluid just after uh, his rebound, but it happened so quickly that we actually, by the time everything got together, it was about a week or two after we first identified virus. CD4 counts have remained stable. So where is it coming from? So here is, uh, I apologize for this, essentially what you need to know is all this stuff up, up here that looks like it's all over the place, is all over the place, that's DNA sequences from his full-length envelope gene of his virus in his cells from before transplantation when we could find it. And it's, you know, it's diverse, it's around. It's kind of typical what we would see when we have someone on ART from their proviral DNA. What you see down below is what we saw uh, just two weeks after rebound. And what you see is essentially it is one sequence. This is a very, very, very highly variable region of HIV, and there is very, very, very few things that are different between these viruses. And when we look at this, we really find this is monophyletic, that this virus is either coming from one or just a few numbers of residual infected cells in the body. Uh, also, there was limited HIV immune responses. They had acute retroviral syndrome. Why? Well, they did because their donors had not seen HIV. They had an HIV-naive immune system. Uh, their antibodies did decline after transplantation that you can see on the top. This is avidity, so it's how strong the antibody response is in addition to how much antibody. But you can see that it does decrease. It actually plateaued for patient A. It never went away completely. Um, where patient B was continuing to decline, and you can see the, the treatment interruption 
looks fairly short on this, but is actually fairly long, just given the, the re reference of days on below. But you can see that there weren't that many huge changes, although maybe the antibodies are going up slightly in the person who didn't restart ART very promptly, and they started to go down in the patient that re did restart promptly. N of 2, we're still looking at this, but uh, we'll keep you updated. Interesting enough, there was no HIV cellular immune responses after stem cell transplant or even before stem cell transplant, which is also interesting. And we first detected cellular immune responses to HIV 15 days after rebound, but initially it was negative. So we went back, because we still had some cells, and we said, well, where is it coming from? Is it coming from the blood, from the gut? Is it coming from the spleen? Is it coming from the lymph node, the brain? Probably not the brain, but we don't know. Uh, where is it coming from? And one of the wings that we can do is we can say, well, we have a lot of peripheral blood that we could look at. So we sort them into different types of CD4 T cells. We have naive T cells, these nucleotidified stem cell memory T cells, central memory T cells. These are the kind of the longer acting memory cells, effector cells on the left. So as you go to the right, these are shorter lived cell lines. And as you can see that in peripheral blood, a vast majority of HIV, well, not a vast majority, but a majority of HIV from uh, Nicolo Schulman's work is actually in these central memory T cells. Uh, in the gut, thanks to Steve Uckel and uh, Steve Wong out at UCSF, uh, it looks like some of the shorter lived populations have higher levels of both DNA and RNA in the gut. Why that is, there's some various uh, uh, hypotheses. But anyways, HIV can persist in these different cells. So we took hundreds of millions of cells and we sorted them into these subsets. Could we find, if sorting these down into the specific populations, increasing our sensitivity? Well, with patient A, we found one very low-level isolated signal from one well, from one assay <laughs> that was repeated many, many times. Uh, we have not been able to uh, sequence this because this is so level. Uh, in patient B, we found nothing in any of the subsets, despite using hundreds of millions of cells uh, and sorting them down. And uh, again, I think this brings up some of the problems with Timothy Ray Brown as well, is that when uh, Steve Uckel and Steve Deeks had taken a look uh, and sent your samples all over the country, you were in so many different labs, it's unbelievable. Uh, you know, people here and there had a little low level here, a little low level over there. Some of them were contamination, some of them they can't sequence, but it's not really thought to be anything meaningful. So this could be contamination contamination, or it could be fossilized DNA that just doesn't do anything. We're not sure. Or maybe it did do something. So one last thought. What led to cure? What about graft-versus-host disease or graft-versus-host effects? And this is where my interest primarily lay. What is going on here? So we know, why does an allogeneic stem cell transplant work? Why does high-dose chemotherapy alone not work for cancer? And that's partly because those donor cells, despite being HLA matched or mostly matched, there are still minor differences. There are these minor antigen mismatch, or minor differences between the donor and the recipient cells. And T cells and NK cells can recognize, in different situations, the tumor, like leukemia, for example, or the hematopoietic cells, which are the CD4 T cells, of course, are part of that, which can harbor HIV, are actually continuously recognized and cleared after transplant by these cells. So this is a very important uh, concept. Now, it can go bad. That's a good thing, by the way. So that's good on the, on the right. On the left is bad. When this reaction starts attacking tissue, when it starts attacking the, the liver, the gut, skin, eye, this is disease, graft-versus-host disease. And this is primarily T-cell mediated, where I think the NK cells may play a very uh, beneficial role in the hematopoietic system. But that's open for debate. So the questions for our patients were, is there an ongoing graft-versus-host effect years after stem cell transplant? Is there a graft-versus-tumor effect? And I can say, yes, there was, because they're still cancer-free. So there's still ongoing surveillance if there's any residual tumor that's being cleared out. Is there graft-versus-host disease? And I would say yes, mostly the skin was mostly kind of either acute or early chronic, but it's actually both patients are uh, essentially off therapy right now for graft-versus-host disease and are doing extremely well. So they're essentially not, don't have graft-versus-host disease now, but have had a history of this. But do they have a graft-versus-hematopoietic cell effect? Because this is what we want. We want those donor cells to recognize recipient cells that could have been, could have been infected and cleared. And it turns out that, yes, they do. They do have an ongoing graft-versus-hematopoietic cell effect. And why is this? Because when we look with extremely sensitive methods with uh, Mike Bush at the Blood Systems Research Institute in San Francisco, uh, less than 0.001% of residual host cells, at least in the peripheral blood, are from the recipient or the original patient. This suggests that there's ongoing surveillance and clearance of residual host cells by graft versus hematic effects. And some of these cells, of course, certainly could have harbored HIV disease, hence why it took us about nine months for us to actually see a lack of detectable HIV in peripheral blood. 
This is my last two slides, but uh, we've hence teamed up with Allison Hill, who with uh, Rosenblum and of course Bob Silicano presented at 2013 in Croy. Uh, how low do you need to go? How many cells do you need left after either stem cell transplantation or whatever therapy you're going to be using do you need to make a lasting difference to achieve either a functional or ablative cure? Well, it turns out, and I apologize for the graph, but on the top is the probability of clearance, the probability of cure, one being 100 percent, zero being zero percent. Down below is the time that it would take if you're not cured for your virus to come back. And if you just assume, and just let's assume that the half-life of the latent reservoir is about 44 weeks, that's an assumption. It's based on some uh, Bob Silicano's data. But let's just assume. Uh, if you have 10 cells left, that's it, 10 cells in your entire body that are able to make replication-competent HIV, they estimate that if you look at the top, you'd have a 95% chance of being cured if you only had 10 cells left. However, if you were 5% unlucky, it could take you several years for that virus to actually rebound. And when it does rebound, it would rebound very quickly, which is what we saw. Now let's say not 10 cells, let's go to 100 cells, because here's the inflection point. If you have 100 cells left, which is not a lot, that's very small compared to what the normal burden of the reservoir in the body is, you only have a 40% chance of ablative cure now. Yet, if that 60% of the chance it does come back, it could still take up to two and a half or even three years for this virus to return. Now, this is mathematics. It's not necessarily science, but I think it's very interesting intellectual experiment. So we actually recruited Allison, who's just a few blocks away, uh, to revise our models. And we work with Allison to revise the models to fit the transplant situation, because it's a little bit unique. Um, it's not your, your typical uh, situation. And what she did, ignore the kind of top variables, but she estimated, using her model, what the number of infected cells that are able to make replication-competent virus in our patients actually are. And what she found is that in patient A, she thought there are hundreds to thousands of cells left over, which is still very low. In patient B, she estimated only tens to hundreds of cells left in the entire body. Again, these are estimates. And then she said, well, using that information, I'm going to say that patient A has a 0 to 3 percent chance of cure. But uh, if they're not cured, if they're the 97 percent to 100 percent that are not cured, it could take 8 to 52 weeks. She did this without knowing our results, and certainly this patient unfortunately rebounded in 12 weeks and had a 0 percent chance of cure. So she was within her very large error confidence, but of course it's, it's modeling, so we'll, we'll, we'll let her have this large, very large interval. But she was right. If you look at patient B, she predicted 28 to 165 weeks, and there would be up to a 65 percent chance of a cure. It was 32 weeks, so she, again, guessed what we would happen. However, this is not all that bad. Perhaps if we had five patients like patient B, or 10 patients like patient B, maybe three or four of them would have had sustained HIV-free viral remission. And that's certainly possible. So to conclude, we found that viral rebound occurs despite reduction in reservoir size of at least three logs, which is a lot to try to get to. Uh, most other modalities can't, you know, half a log would be considered great. Uh, rebound in the context of HIV naive immune system resembles acute HIV infection, unfortunately. So we have moderately severe symptoms, rapid viral kinetics, very, very rapid. And also long-lived tissue reservoirs inaccessible to sampling may have contributed to viral persistence. Okay, we can, our tests are very good, but if we're not looking at the right material, the right tissue, or it just happens to not be there at that time when we sample it, we're not going to find it. So I think the problem is it's, a, it's an access and a sampling issue more than it is an assay issue at this time for me. And because of this, treatment interruption, or this ATI, analytical treatment interruption, I think they're now called monitored pauses, I guess is the new word for them, maps or something like that. Uh, that'll be coming out soon, uh, remains the most reliable measure of viral persistence despite the potential risk to patients and the potential need for long-term intensive clinical monitoring. If you can go a year and your virus can come back within seven days, you have to continue intensive monitoring if you're going to be doing these types of studies. And with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the myriad of people that have contributed to this project, especially their clinical oncologists and the patients themselves. So, thank you. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, does anybody have anything they'd like to ask Tim? Well, I do, so let me, let me get started. There's, there's another factor I didn't hear you uh, discuss, which is the immunosuppressants that are used post-transplant. Right. And, you know, there's, there's a range of different uh, <coughs> degrees of immunosuppression. 
with solid organ transplantation, there's been some interesting data mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. rapamycin-like drugs may be better yes. after transplant than other immunosuppressants. What, can you tell us about yes. what your patients had? So uh, interesting, so rapamycin or serolimus is an mTOR inhibitor, uh, and it, it is an immunomodulatory drug. It is immunosuppressive, but also does a whole bunch of other things. It makes mice live longer. Uh, it potentially boosts vaccine responses. It may preserve T cell function. It, so it does a lot of things that we don't very well understand. Uh, but both our patients were on serolimus uh, as per this reduced intensity conditioning protocol for many months after transplant. And I know Steve Deeks and uh, Peter Hunt just showed the data, or Tom Stock actually, the, in the renal transplant patients that patients on serolimus have lower HIV-1 DNA. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm now heading up a study through the ACDG, the A5337, where we're looking at serolimus treatment now in patients on suppressive ART, uh, who uh, will hopefully to look for differences in both uh, uh, cell-associated RNA, DNA levels, replication-competent virus, uh, uh, et cetera. So it's of, of very much interest, and I think uh, we don't really understand how it works. Uh, it has potential mechanisms that would make sense that it's good for HIV, uh, but we just don't know. So I think what we have to do is a controlled trial, and that's it's what we're doing. T it does induce Tregs. That is correct. Absolutely. So, yeah. Dr. Taiwo? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Tim, for that excellent talk. So what about, uh, do you think or do you foresee any role for monoclonal antibodies, um, say, after you've done the yeah. stem cell transplantation? Because it looks like we're close to where we want to get to. If you can get the uh, residual cell population to, you know, 60 cells or something like that, mm -hmm. could you use, like, uh, the VRC1 thing to give yeah. you a boost? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, the thought of, of using these new monoclonals, uh, you know, Dan Baruch's in this Nature paper with extremely rapid viral decay. I mean, within days, the virus just disappeared. And it was probably just being soaked up by the antibody. There may be other off immune effects, not just direct antibody effects, but increasing immune surveillance, et cetera. So uh, I think there is potential a role for that. I think there definitely needs to be studies looking at these very potent uh, uh, kind of novel uh, monoclonals and, and whatnot to see if there is a role. Um, you know, there is a slight decline in DNA uh, in these patients as well after the monoclonals are given, although it does seem to plateau out like we would see in long-term ART. It's just so much faster uh, in its action. So I think there, there is certainly a potential role for that, especially also in acute infection. One can also, or even post-exposure prophylaxis, it may have a, a very important role. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Great talk as usual. Um, so a question about the sequences. So patient A was a perinatally infected yeah. person and with a very diverse reservoir, yeah. yet you had rebound with a monophyletic uh, sequence. So do you know, was that wild type or was it uh, drug resistant? Uh, it, uh, it, it was uh, interesting enough. Uh, we don't have a lot of resistance testing before transplant. Uh, we do have some information from the cells, and we do know that he has extensive PI resistance, uh, not to darunavir, not to adazanavir, but to a lot of the other PIs, probably because he was kind of on and off therapy as a child. Um, so, uh, but what's interesting is that uh, with rebounds, um, he still has that PI resistance, uh, extensive PI resistance, although it's, it's monophyletic. Um, so it's unclear exactly what, it seems like it may be a virus that was later on that's coming back. I, I, I can't really know for sure. Yeah. But, so I mean, so that would yeah. say it's, it's actually a recently derived right. variant that fueled rebound viremia rather than say some stem cell or some recalcitrant CNS reservoir there. Because with wild type, you know, that would support that theory, you know, that it's really a recalcitrant cell. So it's intriguing mm -hmm. that it's with rebound with a more recent variant rather than a, a very ancestral It's certainly variant. possible that it is more recent, yeah. And then in the yeah. second patient, was it a similar pattern of a monophyletic So we're still cell? clarifying that now. Mm -hmm. uh, the second patient, by the time actually we caught, was several weeks after the initial upswing, unfortunately. So there was some rapid expansion viral replication before we had the initial sample. Uh, but it looks like it's the same uh, informally, yes. It's certainly mono or very, very oligophyletic. Thank yeah. you. Please keep your questions short. Harry first. Did you at all monitor cellular activation markers and the right. T cells on any of the patients? Uh, yes, yeah, so we looked at, uh, I didn't show the data, I apologize, but we did look at uh, T cell subset, um, both CD4 and CD8 subset. Uh, uh, engraftment and recovery after transplantation, and we're actually looking at that now during treatment interruption and post-rebound as well, so that's in process. Uh, but they actually do have, they have a decline in all of their subsets right after uh, transplantation. They do recover together, but we don't know what happens yet uh, in this time. That's, that's in process. And in terms of inflammation markers, we're definitely interested in that. The problem is these patients, 
Uh, they have cancer, they've under transplant, and they've been on immunosuppressive medications, and there are only a few of them. So we're doing it, but I don't know how I'm going to interpret it. So, uh, but it's a, it's a really good question, I think, yeah. Right. That was essentially going to be my question. T cell or monocyte activation markers and systemic mark, mark markers of inflammation, yep. and yep. you're going to characterize yeah, them. Yeah, they, they're being characterized as we speak. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay. All right. Next is Dr. Rob Murphy from the uh, ID division and the Center for Global Health at Northwestern. Thanks, Rich. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, some great presentations today. Uh, in 2009, I had just finished a sabbatical in France, was working at uh, Pitié Salpêtrière with uh, Christine Cadlemont and Brigitte Autrin, and we saw the, the article in the New England Journal, and uh, we said, hmm, maybe we can take some of the strategies we're using in this therapeutic vaccine group that we're working with uh, and uh, look for a, uh, some evidence of a cure. Uh, we had uh, met at a vaccine meeting, uh, actually in France also that year, with uh, Gary Nabel, who at the time was at the vaccine research, leading the vaccine research center at the NIH. Uh, and uh, uh, we came up with this big idea of giving the uh, the AD5 vaccine, which the NIH had, uh, along with IL-7 together. Um, very quickly, the regulatory people said that we could not do that uh, until we actually investigated both of them uh, together. And that was probably a very good idea, as you're going to find out. It's a, this is a very strange title for a presentation, by the way. Don't, don't get too depressed. Um, I try not to get too depressed. <laughs> I, I, let, I should have uh, read that uh, email. Um, but anyhow, so uh, we put, uh, we tried to figure out a way to do this very efficiently, and I think we can learn from some of the clinical trials. Uh, and this is actually the first time we've pre presented the data with both of these trials together. Uh, they've been presented as posters uh, individually uh, at the last two CROIs. Uh, but our, our focus was just to look and see if we have any activity uh, in the reservoir, uh, and uh, looking at uh, uh, an option that involved um, uh, um, an immunotherapeutic intervention plus an intensification uh, of the uh, ART uh, regimen. So it was this uh, two, uh, two prong uh, approach. Think back to 2009. The article just comes out, the proof of concept, you can maybe cure somebody. Um, what was really available? We were doing a lot of intensification studies. As you know, of course, they don't work. Uh, you had to do intensification plus uh, something else. Uh, and so uh, we, we picked a couple of products that I'll, I'll tell you about in a second. So our objectives were pretty limited. We didn't think that either one of these things would work, but that if we had some evidence then that it, the reservoir was affected by them, that we could take that forward and maybe even do a combination trial with these two uh, particular agents. So the primary objective was decreasing the reservoir. And, and the way we were looking at the reservoir was looking at uh, peripheral HIV proviral DNA. Although we measured DNA everywhere, uh, in the gut, we looked at all the um, uh, immune changes that happened. We, we tried to look at reservoir dynamics, and of course, we were looking at safety with these products. Um, the sample size and the way we approached this was very similar to a phase 2A cancer study, uh, in that uh, it's a called colloquially kick out the losers, uh, and that if you take 14 patients, put them uh, in some kind of intervention arm, and no patient succeeds. That means the success rate is less than 20 percent, and you just move on to the next uh, therapy. So it's, it's different from all the other statistical approaches that we do uh, for the typical studies that we do. But we were, we're trying to find some way that, you know, if we could cure 5 percent or 10 percent of patients, I mean, that's still a gigantic advance. Uh, and, uh, and so we were willing to uh, accept uh, this type of uh, statistical analysis. If at least one person responds, then you should go forward. So the combined, uh, the studies were analyzed together, the central laboratories were together, uh, and um, so we had uh, a, uh, our control arm was actually not a control arm, it was intensification alone. And that was using raltegravir and maraviroc on top of what they were already on. Um, and there were 14 patients in each of the studies uh, that, in, that uh, ended up in, in that arm that you see on, the, uh, on your left. Uh, Aramune 01, which is the, the name of one study, the study where we then uh, intervened with um, IL-7 uh, was done in Europe. Uh, and uh, patients first went eight weeks on the intensification, and then they had 48 weeks of the intervention. 
In, in the U.S., uh, we did the eight weeks of intensification, uh, and then we gave the R5, uh, the uh, AD5-based uh, uh, vaccine, uh, the DNA, three DNA primes, and then the, the vaccine at week 24. And then the primary endpoint was at week 56, one month after the, uh, the, the completion. Uh, we followed the patients out, uh, actually, also to 80 weeks. So uh, the main inclusion criteria here, uh, adults, 18 to 60, on therapy for at least three years. Actually, the median was uh, over six. Uh, suppressed for at least the last three years, but under 50 copies for at least the last 12 months. And most of them were under 50 copies, but just because of the way the patients were coming from, some of them didn't have the, the test. Uh, CD4 count over 350 at screening. Uh, we interest, uh, of note is that uh, we did not have any limitations on the nadir, which uh, of course may have played a role here. Uh, the proviral DNA, which is our primary endpoint, had to be between 10 and 1,000 copies per million PBMCs. Uh, and in the U.S. study, the AD5 vaccine uh, intervention, uh, they had to have, uh, they, did, they couldn't have adeno uh, neutralizing antibody titers present which was, uh, I think, approximately a third to a half of the patients had that and were, were rejected because of that. Uh, they couldn't have uh, co-infection with hepatitis B, C, or prior, prior maravirac or rotegravir, which weren't so common back then. So the first intervention is with the IL-7. Uh, and this was a, a very hot drug uh, in 2009. Um, uh, Cetheris was the manufacturer. They're based in Paris. Uh, I think, I'm not even sure if the company uh, is viable at this point or has been uh, bought by somebody else because uh, they had a lot of setbacks, uh, including uh, this, this particular trial that you're going to see. But we, we, we picked that uh, because uh, we thought that this is going to induce HIV production in, uh, in the, these resting cells and then you have all this other drug on board and whatever and that you're going to be able to extinguish or at least have some kind of impact uh, on, the, uh, on the viral reservoir. And they had some preliminary data that was confusing, but uh, at least it was suggestive that it could be done. Um, these results were presented in 2012 at the CROI, uh, and actually what happened was completely the opposite, uh, and that well, all what we did was actually we increased the reservoir. Uh, it did uh, really the opposite. So you can see here at uh, week, uh, by week 12, where you see the difference, the red is with the intervention, the yellow is the control, which is just the intensification, the, the reservoir is actually increased, the peripheral reservoir. And this was actually matched in the gut uh, as well. Uh, fortunately, uh, by the end of the, the follow-up period, uh, it came down to baseline. Uh, but also of note here, uh, oops, the screen went off. My screen went off. Anyway, of note here, um, at week 80, uh, you're actually seeing a, a, a somewhat of a decline uh, in the, um, uh, uh, oops, what happened there? I want to go backwards. Yeah, okay. Week 80, uh, you see uh, uh, there is um, actually uh, almost, uh, there is somewhat of a decline uh, in the reservoir uh, in the, uh, in the, inter in the um, intensification arm only, whereas the intervention arm comes back to the baseline. Uh, this is just the data from the gut uh, here, uh, showing really the same thing. They had an increase in the reservoir in the gut, uh, as well as, as the periphery. Uh, they had, uh, uh, everyone knows what happens with IL-7 and CD4 counts. Uh, CD4 count goes wild. Uh, the original study uh, was uh, to actually have two or three of these cycles of IL-7. Uh, but there was such a, a, a robust uh, response uh, for the CD4 count that actually the protocol got modified and they just had the one uh, intervention, which is probably, now that we see all the results, probably a good idea. So you have this huge uh, increase in CD4 cells that uh, stays up but comes back down to baseline by week 80. Um, now, in the uh, AD5 vaccine study, which was done here in the U.S., um, you don't need a statistician here. As you can see, that really nothing is happening uh, to the, reservoir, the peripheral uh, reservoir. There's really no change, uh, no impact at all on the DNA here or uh, in the rectal tissue. Um, however, there's a couple interesting things in this study. Um, this is the intensification arm over here. There is one patient in the intensification arm that hits the endpoint. And there's two other patients. Uh, I'll show you here. This is uh, two other patients that come right down to almost 0.5. And this is 0.5 in the one patient. So there's three patients that either hit the, hit the endpoint or come very close to the endpoint. 
And it just brings up the issue of maybe some of these intensification studies. This is a very long intensification study. This is uh, 52 weeks of, of uh, 56 weeks of intensification therapy. So perhaps we just need longer intensification if, we're, if that is ever going to be part of any of these particular regimens. On the, on the, uh, the right part, uh, the right panel over here, you see uh, uh, the, the, it must be the effect of the vaccine or whatever, but the, no one even comes close to, to hitting an endpoint. Uh, the immunologic effect of the vaccine was actually pretty good. Uh, compared to their published data, this is, was supplied to us by the VRC. Um, their original uh, uh, immunologic responses were about half what they saw uh, in this study here, uh, and they only lasted 30 to 60 days, whereas our response is out over, over uh, actually between three and six months. So we had a good, it was probably a good response, probably because of patient selection more than anything, because in their original studies, it was more of a mishmash of patients. Our patients were very controlled. They had probably had lower uh, DNA to begin with and, and were generally uh, uh, more uh, better off immunologically. We looked at ultra-sensitive uh, viral loads in these patients. Um, it's a little bit confusing here. This is if, uh, so the total number um, is uh, on the, uh, should be on the very bottom. And then these are the patients that are testing positive uh, using the ultrasound, uh, ultra-sensitive test down to one copy, okay? Uh, and uh, remember, up to week eight is just uh, the um, uh, um, intensification uh, point. And then from week 12 up to 56 is with the, uh, the uh, IL-7. So you see here, although the numbers are really pretty small, uh, it's, it's really hard to do statistics, you see as soon as you give the, the IL-7, yeah, you've got a lot more patients actually uh, um, have, showing some sign of replication here. And then that, that effect appears to diminish, but uh, there's no statistics here, so I wouldn't get too excited about it, but there is viral replication ongoing uh, in uh, quite a number of these particular patients. In the um, AT5 vaccine group, uh, it appears pretty much uh, stable uh, throughout the whole thing, and it doesn't look like there's really uh, an impact uh, of the vaccine on this low-level viral replication that's, uh, that's present uh, in these patients. Certainly no big decrease. Uh, Chad Achenbach, who I don't think is here, I think he's actually uh, on service right now, um, and uh, Johan Gach, who was here uh, in the microimmuno department, or in the, in the cancer center, uh, did a uh, sub-study um, looking at uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, and these antibodies are, are present, um, and um, uh, we can find specific antibody responses uh, to, uh, uh, in patients uh, after many years of art suppression. And it's really unclear because they have much less uh, antigen exposure, and, but they do have improved B cell function. So there's a a yin-yang there uh, as to uh, what the impact is going to be. So we took 51 patients who were screened. This is just a cross-sectional uh, study looking at, uh, at these uh, uh, neutralizing antibodies. And we found that um, th there's a lot of patients have neutralizing um, antibodies. Uh, and um, that it, the higher numbers uh, tended to be associated with people who actually had more prior exposure uh, to HIV. Uh, and in 22%, of uh, the patients, um, they, they did neutralize, uh, at least uh, one of the viruses tested, uh, and a couple of the patients actually, uh, uh, or one patient uh, neutralized eight of 12 viruses that, that they were exposed to from multiple clades. And uh, this again was associated with more time to detectable HIV RNA and a higher Nader CD4 count and a higher proviral DNA. So more exposure, more antibody production, whatever. Uh, and uh, whether this is a cause or effect is unclear. But now, because of this data, we're actually uh, f following the, the um, we're, we're repeating these uh, assays out longitudinally because we have the patients out uh, to 80, uh, 80 weeks. Um, so the, um, uh, we do find these uh, antibody titers, and, and, uh, and I think what's important uh, is uh, the last point really on here is that uh, what should we do with all this? Uh, should we reevaluate new and more potent neutralizing antibody therapies? Uh, this is the approach the NIH is taking. Uh, they basically have abandoned the therapeutic uh, vaccine department and HIV for cure or anything else, uh, and they've moved on and they have their own uh, pool of uh, agents. And I think uh, one of them is being tested at the University of Pennsylvania with uh, Pablo Tabas, and another study is being planned uh, with the ACTG right now. 
um, and uh, those are going forward. And the other question is, should we, can, should we continue with the vaccine development, but we need better vaccines? Perhaps the vaccine we're using is just, is just a, not a strong enough vaccine, so I'm not sure they're really dead uh, or not. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, uh, for these two uh, studies, IL-7 increased the reservoir, so this is not gonna be good. Uh, the AD5 vaccine really had no impact uh, on the reservoir wherever we tested it. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, one patient in the intensification group uh, and, uh, and plus two others ha did have some kind of suggestion of, some, of a response. Based on the statistical analysis, uh, we would have to say that this is worthy of further study uh, if you believe our original hypothesis. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but this is one of the longest intensification studies and most intense because it's two agents. You know, these patients had never been exposed to integrase before. And they'd never been uh, with a CCR5 inhibitor, and they're suppressed for a long time. So that uh, could be part of something uh, in the future. Um, we saw very good immunologic responses with the vaccine group. Uh, but neither of these uh, approaches is really viable for a cure strategy, and certainly there's no reason to go forward really with either one of those, and actually both of the drugs have been abandoned. Um, but perhaps longer intensification, better vaccines, and this uh, neutralizing antibody therapy uh, is, uh, is, is a, a potential. Um, the challenges we face are, are a lot. Um, Number one, identification, what is the appropriate endpoint? I don't even think anyone can answer that question. Ultimately, you have to get to some kind of treatment interruption, but when is it even safe based on your preliminary studies when you can even get to that particular point? Um, what about patient selection? Uh, probably every patient is not gonna ever get to a point where they're in a, could even be cured. Um, probably the need for a multi-targeted approach, some kind of combination is there. Uh, and what is the actual minimum evidence necessary uh, before you can actually stop uh, somebody's therapy. And I think from a practical perspective, from a therapeutic practical perspective, how do you do this fast? Um, we had basically green lights all the way. The idea started in 2009. The protocols were developed in 2010. We had the one preliminary result in 2012 and the second preliminary result in, in 2013. And now you're seeing it presented both all together for the first time in 2014. That's you know, a good five years really from start to finish. And that's everything with all the imports, the uh, transferring the license, the tech agreements, all that kind of stuff. You know, this stuff is not easy. So I don't th if anyone thinks they're gonna cure this thing in five years, I think they're, they're kidding themselves. Um, it's going to take a, a lot, I'm, I wish we could do it in five years, <laughs> but five to, I think more like 10, 10 to 15, I, I'm very positive. But just to do this study, okay, with uh, 28 patients, uh, uh, 56 patients total, uh, involved all these groups and all these people. This, this was actually a monumental uh, uh, effort here, starting at PTS Afitriere with Christine and, and her group and, uh, and Brigitte. Uh, our sites in Europe included the, uh, a site in London with, uh, with Mike Ewell, uh, two, actually two sites in uh, Barcelona, one in Barcelona, one in Barcelona with uh, Clotet and, and uh, Gattel, another site uh, in, uh, in Milan, uh, our own central group, uh, we had Merck donating the uh, drug and, and uh, Viv uh, and uh, the uh, Inserm and, and uh, the people, the virology, the immunologists, I mean, it is, it's enormous. And that's just the European side. And then you got the Americans, you know, so, you know, you got me and the group here um, uh, with uh, Chad Baiba, Steve Walensky, Kevin Kunzman, uh, Byron Yip, who's left, and, and, uh, and Meredith uh, Rathert. And then you've got Steve Deeks in the group at San Francisco and Tim Wilkin at uh, Cornell. Uh, and then uh, the NIH actually played a huge role in this. Not only did they donate the drug, but they did all the immunologic assays that were shipped to them and everything, uh, led by Rick Kaup uh, and Joe uh, Casenza and uh, Barney Frank uh, in particular, uh, with the, the, the other lab group that I mentioned on the other slide. So it's, it's, it's an enormous effort and it took a lot of time. And, and uh, those are the results. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you didn't have to sober me up that much. <laughs> <laughs>
So I have a question for yes. you. Um, I'm not aware of another intensification study that used a CCR5 antagonist. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that's another factor that may have accounted, you know, not just the length of time, but maybe there's something different about blocking entry. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of work, probably there's some immunologists in here that know it better than me uh, about uh, CCR5 inhibitors, and we were actually concerned about that issue at the beginning, uh, what the impact of that would be. And so it's uh, a great question. Nobody's done it, especially with two. Two, also, no, I don't think anyone's on two agents no, that long. No, I think it's mostly been integrase yeah, inhibitors. Yeah, it's mostly been integrase inhibitors alone uh, and protease inhibitors. Okay, we'll go yes. here and then the next. I'm curious about the IL-7 therapeutic uh, study. Uh, very interested in that 80-week time point where you saw that there was actual reduction in the size of the reservoir. And that was in the, the intensification only. Intensification only. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the the the, the, uh, the, the IL-7 group came back to baseline. Okay. So during the course, so the IL-7 caused preferential outgrowth for the CD4 cells. Yeah. And you monitored the size of the reservoir by looking at total DNA and PBMCs. Right. So the question is, if you sort out subsets, and if you look on a cell by cell basis, does the representation or the frequency of the virus DNA does that change at all? Because I don't understand the bulk amount of yeah. virus is higher, but what yeah. happens on a cell-by-cell uh, cell basis? It's been done uh, just because uh, this was only a 15-minute presentation. I wasn't able to go through all the other subsets, uh, but uh, they have been, they actually have been done and some are being, still being done. Um, there's, with the IL-7 group, there's increases in some of the subsets. Uh, in the AD5 vaccine group, there's no change. Let's go over to Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm uh, learning more and more about these, these antibodies. And so um, the, the fascinating thing is it seemed like your anti-GP120 antibodies were greater than 41, and, and that usually doesn't happen, um, my understanding. So that could be, uh, is that the result? I guess that's the result they're excited about? Well, that, yeah, they're excited. And we're actually now, we're taking that and we're doing, um, we're testing other time points. Uh, throughout the study. That's just at the baseline. That's even before the intensification. That includes patients who are screened who are not even in the study. Okay. So maybe it's less exciting. Uh, are you going to have to give me another <laughs> six months All right. to answer the question? It's a deal. It's, we, are gonna, we are looking at that. Let us know when you have the results. Yes. <laughs> so, so maybe my answer will be we're looking at it. But, uh. Uh, but can you tell us anything about, you know, AL7 was uh, it increases HIV transcription in vitro, and mm -hmm. it also is a great CTL inducer uh, yep. relative to CD8 function. Mm -hmm. um, and so was there anything that you can comment on that between the biological impact of IL-7 and the expansion of the reservoir? I mean, was, for example, the reservoir immediately went up, or did it go up over time, and did no, these it, biological it, effects, were they tracking it, anything? It immediately went up. In every comp well, we only looked at gut and in the periphery. Okay, it immediately went up, uh, and relatively quickly started to come down. Uh, there was that one slide that had it. Uh, it flipped up uh, in the first four weeks, and then it started coming down and uh, was at baseline, approximately baseline by week 80. And was rectal tissue also? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Fewer so patients with the rectal uh, biopsies, but the, the the pattern was the same. Yeah, so to follow up on Luis's question, because I, I mean, the, the optimism for IL-7 has been dampened by the, you know, expansion of the reservoir mm -hmm. under IL-7 treatment, but I think Irina Soretti's data now shows that with IL-7 you get immune reconstitution in the gut, which we never see with prolonged heart, and I wondered if the Air Immune Group has gone back and looked at the IL-7 data and its correlation with, you know, gut immune reconstitution and then redistribution to baseline levels uh, by week 80. I, it is being done, but uh, there, part of it, there is, an, there is a change in the gut and there's an increase in the gut, okay? Um, but the kind of studies you're talking about are still actually underway. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. And uh, we're going to take a, a break and come, we'll come back for um, some more talks at 2.35. And the refreshments are out where lunch was. <laughs>